So we've gotten a little bit of a start. We've combined our like terms on both sides of the equation, paying attention to signs, because if you don't pay attention to signs, that's going to mess you up anyway. At this point, you have choices. Once you get here, a lot of people, maybe they all want the x's on the left. Sometimes they want a positive. I'm more of the positive type. I like trying to keep them positive. I don't like care which positive. side they're on. I, I do. So, move up here. And get that in there and situated. And now it's just like a regular old two-step algebra one problem. I just got to go ahead, get my 7x isolated. And then divide by 7. And I really don't want the decimal here. I don't want like whatever it is, 1.14 or whatever it is. Because when you're doing regular standardized testing, you're going to see fractions. They're not going to be decimal form. So just to kind of get you used to that a little, we'll stick with it that way. So you're like, why do we have to do a problem that big? Well, basically at this point, we're kind of testing you out to see if you can stick to detail long enough not to make a mirror somewhere. I'll be honest. Number two, a little shorter. Still got to distribute. Still have to be careful because where does the error get made here every time? Not here, but right here. People go negative and they see negative and they write negative 3x. And I'm going, uh, 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 not going to work. Negative times negative is positive. So we get that in. And now it's just like what we did in the last one. We're going to go ahead and get our x's together. And again, either side doesn't matter. And now it's just, again, like a regular old two-step equation. And again, don't let the fact that things aren't coming out nice in whole numbers throw you off and think you're doing something wrong. Oops. This is done purposefully because I don't want people to just do like plug and chug and all that stuff. I want you to actually have to work through the problems to get to the answers on things. And you always want to check to see if a number reduces, but 2 doesn't go into 23, so I can't go any further than this. So that's, that's basically it on that one. I'll keep that in there just a second. There we go. So for 3, and we talked about this. I remember doing this that Thursday I was here. If you see a proportion, and there's pluses or minuses, we want to put com commas, <laughs> parentheses around those. Because then when you go to cross multiply, we remember that we have to distribute those values all the way through. So once I get it set up, and it doesn't matter which side they're on, I'm going to go ahead and multiply the 8 through, multiply the 3 through. And now we're back to what we were looking at in the first two problems. Variables on both sides, so I need to get those all together. So I can minus the 6x. Since I'm trying to isolate the 2x, I'd minus the 24 over. And then I just divide by 2. Again, not bad stuff. Mainly Algebra 1 stuff. It's just a little bit lengthier, so you've got to be a little more cautious. Then come the ones that people typically try to skip. No need to skip them. In one step, we're going to have all the fractions gone. And we talked a little before about this. Instead of necessarily having to find the LCD, and sometimes you will on accident, if you multiply the numbers together in the denominator, and if you have a repeater, don't use it. 
So like here, I'm just gonna multiply seven times three together, which is 21. And I'm gonna multiply through here by 21. Now I could write all of the stuff out that's coming, but let me show you for on one of them how it works, and then we'll kind of be able to buzz through a little quicker. So just kind of watch for a second. If I multiply the top of this by 21, it would look something like this. But then I'd look at it and I'd say, hey, 21 divided by 7 is 3, so it's really just two time, 3 times 2r minus 3, which I could get by just taking this number divided by this. 21 divided by 7 is 3. I put it out front and copy what's left over. So like here, same thing. For this next one, 21 times 3 would be 63 divided by 7 is 9. Or you could do the same thing we just did. 21 divided by 7 is 3 times 3 is 9. We're just getting rid of the fraction stuff. And then the last one, 21's on top, so 21 divided by 3 is 7. And we just multiply that times our negative r. We're just doing it in pieces, but if you're more visual, if you want to do some of the side work like I've done here, there's nothing wrong with that ever. You've got to do what you have to do to make it work for you. But just like that, all the fractions are gone, and now I can get down to my business of finishing this. So I'll distribute my 3. And I notice I've got like terms here, but what happens when I put them together? Negative 9 and positive 9 cancels out. And this is the next place that a lot of people start to panic. They're like, wait a minute, Hardy, there's no numbers left, it's just variable terms. That's okay. We still want to get them all to one side. So me, my preference, I'm going to add 7r to both sides. And when I do, on the right side, it's not that there's nothing there anymore, it's zero. Zero is a value, that's okay. So if you run out of terms on one side, we just replace it with zero. And zero divided by anything is still just going to be zero. And we're set. So are there a few places some pitfalls can come? There, there sure is. There sure is. But it's just one of those things we've got to work through a little bit. So for five, if we use the same rule we just used there, and the four repeated, so we don't need it for both times, what am I going to multiply through by? Multiply them all together. The denominators, two and three and four. Huh? Yes. 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 Nobody's telling me the number though. Oh, oh. Wait. It's 24. 24. So if we just multiply 2 times 3 times 4, we get 24. And we start this process over again. So again, the way I do it, because the numbers stay a little bit smaller, is if I take this, because here's basically, again, what we're doing. I'll just kind of show it off to the side here again. Basically, what you have is you have 3 fourths, and the 24 is up top. So you could either multiply and then divide, or what I like to do is I do 24 divided by 4 is 6, times 3 is 18 because I could just do 24 times 3 is 72, okay? It works both ways, but you have to deal with it. Now, some of you may say, can I do this in the calculator? My answer is, uh, yeah. Let me show you. If I want to do it on the calculator, all I would do, and this would be true on any calculator, I would do 24 times 3, and on the calculators in here, I just use the division button as my fraction sign. 
times 3 fourths. There's my 18. So even if you're not an expert with the multiplication facts, you can still do this, and you can do it for all of them. So like on the next one, I wasn't sure. 24 times 5 halves. And if I did this right, I should get whole numbers out for all of these. Yep, 60 plus 60. So you can even do it on the calculator if, again, that makes you feel more comfortable. 2 times 24 is 48, divided by 3 is 16. Get my calculator out of the way here for a moment. And then 120 divided by 4 is 30. And again, they're all doable on the calculator if you want to. And now it's just like every other one. We've got ourselves a, an equation. These guys are separate, so I'm going to subtract the 16x over. Minus my 60. Divide both sides by 2. Okay. And that is, that's kind of our breakdown of the stuff that we've been doing that Thursday into Friday type stuff, seeing how that goes. The other thing besides fractions I found in this first quiz, people tend to be like, uh, on is when I start showing off with isolating equations for the indicated variable. People freak out when they see multiple variables and there's no reason to. Okay, solve for L, okay? My job is to get that alone. Okay, so I have this plus 2w there I need to get rid of. I do the opposite. No biggie. And then since I'm trying to solve for L, and I'm multiplying it by 2, I just divide both sides by 2, and I'm done. And no, you don't have to reduce here, because if you cancel the 2's, that actually becomes an issue. Just leave it as one big fraction, and you're good to go. Just give yourself a chance on these. That, that's the biggest thing with most of them. Same deal working on 7. My goal is to get C alone, i got to get the C. Now, this is a little different. You're like, well, i got the plus 160 and the divide by 5. What do I do? I always tell people, work the furthest away. The plus 160 is still up in the numerator. The 5 is further away, so we're going to get rid of it first. And since a fraction is like division, it's like dividing by 5, we do the opposite and multiply by 5. Now, notice I didn't distribute the 5 because the 5 got canceled on this right side. But again, my job, get C alone. So I'll do the opposite of plusing 160. And since I'm trying to solve, I can just divide by 9. Again, just leave it as one big fraction. Because if we did want to solve something sometime, it would be easier leaving it in that big mode anyway. But I will admit, number eight is the trickiest one. What's that? No, but you're thinking correctly. We need to get it to where there's only one H. Because I can't have H in the answer. Because, well, H is what I'm solving for. You can't solve for it and have it in the answer. That's kind of crazy. But they both, both of these terms have an H, right? So what I can do is I can pull an H out, and what we're basically going to do is we're going to do the distributive property backwards. We're going to undistribute this. So if I take the H out, I go, okay, H times what would get me 2H? Where you're like, well, 2, okay. Well, H times what would get me R times H? Well, R. So if you were to distribute what's on the right side right now, would I get this back? 
h times 2 is 2h. h times r is rh. I got it back. And even better yet, there's only one h now. And that's key because that's what I want to solve for. So now I'm multiplying by all this other junk in the parentheses. Well, the opposite of multiplying by it would be to divide by it. And just like that, I get to my answer. But if the variable you're solving for, if you see it twice, you've got to do this undistributive property or reverse distributive property. It's the only way it'll work. If you try anything else, you're going to get H in an answer, and then it's, yeah, it's really no good. But those will keep coming up. I'll even, put, I'll even go through another one of those with you tomorrow just to make sure that we're good. All right, now this is going to get a little trickier on the story problems, keeping it big because we got to shift a little. So, all right. County fair, $6 entrance fee, $2 per ride. Write an equation that describes the relation between rides, R, and cost, C, and dollars for a single customer. In other words, we're just writing an expression for this. We're not solving anything. I'm still a big fan of writing out everything in words. Just because then... When you go to plug numbers in, everything has a place. It's like putting a puzzle together. So like for instance here, our entrance fee was six bucks. Doesn't matter how many rides you do, it's six bucks to get in the door. So we put the six in. The rides though, it does matter how many I did. It's $2 times every one I do. So if I only do two rides and you do five, your total cost is going to be more than mine. But that's all I got to do to set this up. And if you can do it without the words, that's fine. But sometimes it just makes it a little bit easier to focus in on what you're up to. Other times we may take that same type of problem and go, okay, they're going to give me the formula here, but I want to understand the pieces. A rental car company charges $21 a day 21 times D, okay, and 35 cents per mile driven, 0.35 times M, that makes sense, to find the total cost of my rental. Okay, so what do the variables represent? It's like, what's C stand for? Okay, so that would be like the total cost of my rental, depending on how many days I rented it for, how many miles I drove, all that other stuff. And speaking of those other two things, that's our other two variables. D would be my number of rental days, because again, variables stand for numbers. So we gotta use words like total, number, things like that, so we can make sure we're signifying the correct things. And then M would be our number of miles driven. But this time, instead of just having that and being done, we're actually going to apply it in a couple of ways. I'm just going to bump this a little. Won't lose it for those of you that are right in here. Rewrite the previous model equation in terms of C and D. Now, it's just a way we can speak it differently. Isolate M. In other words, solve this expression for M. That's what words like in terms of C and D means. So I'm going to take this equation. And my goal now has become to get M by itself. So if that's my goal, what do I need to do first? How do I make this guy go away? Since I'm adding 21D to that 0.35M, how do I undo the adding? Subtract it. Okay. 
Okay, so we got that out of there. Now my M term is isolated, but I got to get that 0.35 out of there. How do I do that? Divide it. Perfect. Those cancel. And that is what's called isolating M or solving for M in terms of C and D. What, what variables are on the other side of the equation? Like, now, why would I want to do that? Why would I want to get it all jibbered and jabbered up that way? Well, if you look at the last question, you'll see why that's not a bad idea. If the total cost of $119, so we got M equals, cost is 119 because we know that's what C is, and you rented the car for three days, How many miles did you drive? Now all I got to do is plug this into the calculator and I'm good to go. But herein lies a possible problem. So I just look at the way I typed it. So I'm going to start rolling along here. I'm like, okay, 119 minus 21 times 3 divided by 0.35. All right, this should give me the answer. And I'm ready to write it down. It, wait, wait a minute. Negative 61? You can't drive negative 61 miles even if you drive in reverse. What the heck's going on? This calculator must be broken or something like that. No, it's not. The calculator follows order of operations. So what the calculator is thinking you want is to multiply 21 times 3 but then divide by the 0.35 and subtract it. You're like, that's not what I want to do. Okay, there's two ways you can make sure this doesn't happen to you. One way would be to do the two parts separately. So maybe we just do the numerator first and then hit enter instead of doing everything. And then divide by 0.35 and hopefully we get a much happier answer this time, okay? So we get M is 160 miles. If you want to do it in one failed swoop, you actually can. But here's the key. You've got to put what you do up top. If you want to do it all in one step, you've got to do it in parentheses. And you're going to see here in a minute how that will work just by putting the parentheses in there. and it still works, okay. So you have options. If you're more of, you tend to make little errors like I did the first one and get a negative answer. I hope you'd look at that and think something was wrong and go back and try to fix it. But if not, that's the types of things you're gonna have to work on a little bit. Okay, 160 miles makes sense. So now for those of you clamoring for stuff from Friday, our stuff with our inequalities, which we are going to talk more about tomorrow. But I still would suggest looking at some video stuff again if you haven't, because one thing I'll mention, like if you came up to me and this was your paper, you'd be like, okay, I don't get it. I'll be honest with you, I'm going to tell you, well, when you actually try to do something that I can guide you on, I'll help. Blank papers don't give me effort. That's just the way I am. So. At least, if nothing else, you're going to have a couple of these to work with, too, and kind of get into the flow. So solve the inequalities, write your answers in interval notation. We'll come back to this. Treat this just like you do an equation. Same idea. So like here, I like going to where my x's stay positive. That's just me. So I'm going to minus 5x. If some of you like always having your x on the left side and you want to minus 8x instead, that's okay. And now I just solve on getting x by itself, just like I always would. And again, don't freak out if you get something that doesn't come out nice. Now, if in this case, if some of you want to go to a decimal, I still would write it this way. If you want to look at it in decimal form, I think if you round it, it'd be like 2.7 or something like that. We're close. There's a couple of things we have to be careful on here. First thing, I would always sketch a graph of these. You're like, it doesn't say sketch a graph. I understand that. But to do interval notation is very visual. So 
here's kind of the way I would do this. First thing I've got to be able to deal with is how do I read this? Because a lot of people say, well, it's less than. The arrow goes left, so it goes left. No, can't do it that way. Here's how I like to look at it. As far as inequalities go, X is our diva. It's all about X, and it always will be. You always have to speak about X first or X gets offended. 8 thirds is less than X. Oh, wait a minute, I didn't say X first. That's bad. I've got to start with X. X is greater than or equal to 8 thirds. Always look at these from X's point of view. So if the arrow eats X, that is always greater than, and when you draw your arrow, it'll go to the right. So notice, even though my arrow in the inequality is going left, it doesn't mean anything. You've got to pay attention to where the X is at. If, for instance, we do one and the arrow is pointing at X instead, that's less than, and my arrow will go to the left. The only other thing with these we have to pay attention to, because you're like, okay, so the arrow is going to be going right here, I get it, is what symbols we're going to use. Now, this was gone over Friday, but we'll go over it again here. If you have an or equal to, okay, the little line underneath, we use brackets to show that it's or equal to. If it's just less than or equal than with no line underneath, we use parentheses to say, I want all the numbers up to that point, but that number doesn't get included. So on this one, I'm going to use a bracket. And since x is greater than, my little arrow here, my little sketch, is going to be going to the right. So you're like, okay, do we get to get to the interval notation sometime today? Yes, we do right now. Interval notation is just a way of writing where my answers are from left to right. And here's why I wanted to see a graph of it. Where's the point of my graph furthest left where the starts? Right here at 8 thirds. Use the same symbol, the bracket, that you did on your graph. And once it starts going, it goes and goes and goes and goes and goes and goes and goes forever and ever and ever and ever and ever to the right. How do I write that? Infinity. Forever to the right, positive infinity. If we have one that goes forever to the left, that's negative infinity, and it does make a difference. That is my interval notation. Not on infinity, because infinity doesn't have an end point. Good question. Infinities are always parentheses. So you can have mixes and matches with parentheses and brackets. So we run into the same deal on letter B. Same concept. Still trying to solve for x, just like we did on the first one. So after we distribute, it looks a lot like the first one. Well, let's see. This time, I feel like getting all my x's to the left, because I don't want to get confused by this arrow thing. So this time I decide I'm going to do it this way. And again, there's not a right or wrong with this. It just depends on possible situations we might get into. So I'm like, OK, got to get that plus 3 out of there. So I'll do my opposite. Now minus the 3 over. Then I get to a moment of truth. And I go, OK. I know I'm dividing by negative 2. I know that negative divided by negative is positive. There's one rule I've got to remember. Yes. If you multiply or divide both sides by a negative. Okay. You have to flip the arrow. If you don't, you'll get the exact opposite of the right answer. Okay, So if you multiply or divide both sides, it doesn't mean it comes up a negative number. But if I have to use a negative number to multiply or divide to get x alone, i got to flip the arrow. So you're like, hey. 
if I make my quick little sketch, okay, there's my diva x. X is greater than, because the arrow's eating it, but it's not a line under this time, so what symbol am I going to use? Parenthesis. Because that's saying I want all the numbers up to one half, but I don't want to include it. And an arrow going to the right. So you're like, oh, it looks like this one. So the only difference is I use a parenthesis. You still can. You still could do that. You should end up with the same thing at the end, though. You wouldn't necessarily, if you started it the other way, it may not necessarily flip. Let me grab this quick. So like if instead, so you ended up with positive 2 on the other side? Okay. So if I did it where positive 2 would end up on the other side, let me rewrite it quick so you can see. You'll end up with the same answer, but you'll do it without having to flip it. So if you went that route, I'd minus my 2. I'd divide by 2. But notice the arrow is still eating the x, so it's still going to be x is greater than 1 half. So we got the exact same thing. You just went about it a different way. It's all good. And that's the nice thing about the inequalities. You can get to the answer a whole lot of different ways and still have it be absolutely right. Then our last one, we just got set up to do here. No solving. All right. Trip to Germany. German club is selling the Streusel. Customers can buy either apple, Streusel, or black forest cherry. Stephanie sold 16 apple and 45 black forest cherry for a total of $716. Johnny sold 91 apple and 15 black forest cherry for a total of 1181. Set up a system to represent this application. Okay, basically we're gonna dive in here and we're gonna look at these as sentences and make expressions. Stephanie sold 16 apple, I just assume A for apple would be sensible, and 45 black cherry for black Forest Cherry for a total of $716. Again, if you wanted to do words, Apple plus Black Forest Cherry equals total amount of money. Price times quantity equals value. And I'm going to do that same thing for the other one. Johnny, 91 Apple, 15 Black Forest, $1,181. This is my system. That's all I'm being asked to do for that part. Set up a system, do not solve. And then we just explain what our two variables are and what they stand for. A. Don't just say A represents apple streusel. It's close, but it's not quite what we want. We want number of apple streusels. Oops, I misspelled that. And then with me, maybe you use C for cherry, but I used B. Number of black forest cherry. It's getting me hungry. And I misspelled it again. Hey. This is what your first quiz is going to look like Wednesday. So I'm going to have another mini review tomorrow. Otherwise, we're going to spend time tomorrow just working on assignments, working on different things. If I see a bunch of you getting struggling on the same thing, we're going to stop everything. We're going to start working on that. But it's going to be a work day, and we're going to take advantage of it because I don't get a ton of straight work days. But every once in a while they're necessary, especially in this case. So hopefully we'll have you ready and raring to go then.